and I had UK uh, media wanting to get in touch with me and I just wanted to go underground mm. and try and, and get stock of what had happened and and what it meant because really it was an insult on everything I represented. And I thought, oh my God, this is what I live for. And, and someone's telling me, a lot of people are telling me it's not right. Tērā te tahi rā nui i te papatātā whāinga whutupōro o tukena mi te tautahi mano i warau e iwa te kaumaiwa. A ka oti a hene wahi muhi te tahi whakatau kia tākina e ia ko te waiata tira o Aotearoa ki te reo Māori nahe. Me alawā ake ka hae hae katoa te au whānui tērā whakatau āna. E rangi i a ia nei kua tino Māori rawa te kawaia te iwi o Aotearoa i tā tātou waiata o te mutu. A nei te roa ngā keo ngā kōrero. Ko hene wahi muhi. Indigenous 100. Hinewehi, <laughs> te nā koe. I o mahi katoa mahi. <laughs> <laughs> kahurangi hinewehi mohi. Me kahurangi te tika. A te nā koe i whai wahi mai koe ki a mate. Uh, ki te rau o taketake, Indigenous 100. Uh, it's awesome to see you again. And thank you very much for being with us. And I wanted to start by talking to a little... We won't start off with St. Joe's. But we'll get there. We'll get there, right? And we'll talk about Hene Rokotauri. Mm. Uh, and a little bit more about your life. But I want to go back to where everyone likes to start with with you a lot of the time, World Cup 1999. And because I remember where I was when you sang that national anthem, and I remember the effect that it had on me, right? uh, the pride that I felt in seeing you sing our real version of the national anthem before such a pivotal moment in New Zealand. Rugby history, I thought, was, was amazing. What were you thinking before you went on to that altar, that stage, to sing the national anthem at that game? What was I thinking? <laughs> I think I was thinking I wanted to represent our nation, mm. Aotearoa, in the best way I could. Because I was so proud to be asked. And I was in the UK to promote my Real Māori album, mm. and I just felt that it was really important to best represent us. And um, I wasn't actually sure of the English words, and I had performed um, the national anthem in Māori as a duet with um, Peter Ulich mm. at the Rugby League, and I thought, It'll be all goods then. I'll be able to um, really represent Aotearoa and and um, thought that there might be a little bit of resistance, really not thinking that there would be that level of resistance and um, upheaval <laughs> in people's thinking of what was right for our national Did you talk to anyone else about it? Or was it just a, a, a almost a natural kind of thing that you go, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this, this is good, this is why I'm here? Did you consult with anyone else or just thought, nope, cut off you were? Well, it was a natural thing yeah. that, that I thought. And then there was, um, when I had the rehearsal in the afternoon, um, someone came to to see me from the rugby union and, and said, um, oh, could, could, could you do the English version and um, uh, my producer at the time said oh, no, we haven't rehearsed that and um, this is what she's going to do and um, and so I was starting to think oh um, okay <laughs> well uh, ooh, I was second guessing myself uh -huh. but um, I felt really confident about what I was going to do yep. and it was coming from the heart and I was um, <clears throat> very much speaking to te ao whutupaoro, yeah. te ao whanui, about um, how unique and special Aotearoa is. Yeah. And um, and then after I performed, and um, and it was relatively silent 
in the stadium. <laughs> I think maybe seven people were singing <laughs> the national anthem <laughs> with me out of the 75,000. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and the multitudes, millions of um, TV viewing audience. So um, I thought, well, that that really meant something, yeah. and um, uh, hugely proud. And I said to someone, an, an English person, that there may be a, a little bit, <laughs> and and they went, why? Yeah. Because um, they just thought that you know, New Zealand does the haka, and this is uh, their national anthem in Māori. That's all goods, yeah. and um, but they couldn't understand it when it went crazy. And there were a number of Māori on the team. You know, the captain was Tane Randall, Māori, yes. going in, yes. even owner. Uh, Case Muse and Tony Brown was in the team, and I remember as they were panning down the All Black team, and they're all some have a, a hand on their heart and heads bowed and kind of listening, and others were kind of looking around like this. <laughs> um, and, but but for us at home. Right, so I'm at Talavera Terrace in Wellington watching this going, this is awesome, this is the way it it should be. Did did you get an initial reaction from people like, like that? And I know I sent you a little text and stuff, but did you get much of a response from people who felt that sense of pride who were at home? Did that come through quickly to you? Well, to be honest, 20 years ago, we didn't really have the yeah. same sort of um, social media access to people and... Um, and you know we're in the UK with sort of limit. It used to cost an arm and a leg to mm. to text and um, and even computer emailing that kind of communication was limited, and so uh, that was probably a good thing because it sheltered me from uh, um, the barrage. Yeah. And um, social media can be great, but I can also see how it would be ruthless in a situation like that. So Talkback Radio back here was um, going nutso. And uh, I, I so appreciated um, your message of support and, and Uffy because I think um, the Fano at home were going, <laughs> that was awesome, but what's going on? Do you on? know what you've done? <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, if someone had said to me uh, at the time, They'll still be talking about this in 20 years' yeah. time. I would have gone, ha! <laughs> no! <laughs> how how ngā e tahi o ngā kōrero tāunu? Uh, tā wai whakahe, whakaiti rana i tā atu ki hākoe. What, what were people saying? Well, I um, already pre-organised an interview with yeah. the late Super Bowl Holmes. Yeah. And, and so he actually told me how crazy it had gone because he'd, he'd done his talkback radio thing in the morning and he rang me up and, and he said, effing going nuts here. Mm. And I didn't really know him, so I thought, what? <laughs> sheesh, it must be really bad. Yeah. And um, But he was very protective and um, he organised um, an interview uh, with someone who was really against the, the singing of, of the anthem in Māori and... Um, and I was kind of blindsided, even though I thought that there might be some resistance. I, I just had no idea. So um, because we were in the UK, and as I say, we didn't have the same mm. sort of social media access, there was some um, shelter from that. But even in, in the New Zealand UK newspaper that they have in London and, and those kinds of things, and I had um, UK uh, media wanting to get in touch with me and I just wanted to go underground mm. and try and, and get stock of what had happened and, and what it meant because really it was an insult on everything I represented. And I thought, oh my God, this is what I live for. And... And someone's telling me, a lot of people are telling me, it's not right. And it was um, incredibly shocking and um, devastating, actually, as a blow, which is why 10 years later, when you came to me and said, let's look at that, you know, 10 years later, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready. I was still licking my wounds. So really? now, 20 years later, I'm feeling like I'm still crying on national television, but... I feel like I can move on from that because yeah. there is a much greater appreciation for te reo Māori yeah. 
generally, you know, the uh, mozu whanui, and I think that we are ready to um, go handy and um, yeah. cut a few ways. And, and before we get to the profound impact that you have had in Māori, Te Reo Māori Revitalisation, how were you able to deal with that torrent of abuse, racism, that you had to deal with in the immediate aftermath and up until that 10 year period? How did you deal with that? What was your coping mechanisms to be able to deal with it? Okay. Well, at the risk of crying again. <laughs> um, you know, um, te ao Māori, te reo Māori, tikanga Māori, kaupapa Māori, that's, that's what I've lived by. When I was 10, my father decided he was going to learn te reo Māori. And at a time in the 70s when it was really hard to access um, teaching of Māori, so we did the whole whānau did correspondence. And he was really staunch in our little isolated farm in central Hawke's Bay. But he nurtured in me, invested in me a, a real sense of identity, kaupapa, and a need to have this because he hadn't had that when he was growing up. And he was uh, in his early 30s. He was really... Um, realising how important it was to understand himself, know himself and be able to step forward. And anyway, he was the coach slash captain of the Poho Kahungunu rugby team. <laughs> Whenever they went on rugby trips, he was pushed forward on the marae to give a speech and he didn't have anything to offer. And the only thing he really knew was Mimi two times. <laughs> and it wasn't helpful in that context. <laughs> so um, that was what he um, really um, supported us in understanding and appreciating my sister, old sister and I. So um, then I went on to Hatu Hoipa and Te Whariwa and Waikato and, and, and fully um, uh, drowned myself in all the, the um, understanding. And I had wonderful tutors at Te Whariwa so it was an incredible opportunity to really understand what it um, all meant. And um, so by the time I got to singing on an international stage like that, I was thinking that this is all normal, this is all perfectly wonderful. And I probably was in a bubble from Hato Ho Hepa to Te Whariwananga mm. Waikato because that was our thinking. We were all um, on the same waka. Subsumed by that, yeah. Yes. That's your world. That is. Yeah. So by the time it came to um, some knockbacks, um, I, I I was kind of vulnerable anyway because Hina Katoni was three and you know she has severe cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. so she has really high needs. And um, George and I were in the UK, sort of um, with not much support around us, and I was just thinking okay, I actually need to step back from this and, and try and um, get stock of, of what it means on a whole lot of levels without sort of trying to sound over dramatic. But it really did question everything that I was about. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, uh, I was just nuts because it was basically saying te reo Māori is not important. You know, the whole idea of it being a dying, dead language that's irrelevant to our world. It's never going to get you a job. Mm. <laughs> that's the only job I've ever had. <laughs> well. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty well. <laughs> Walked free. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I, I just took a, a long time, maybe 20 years, <laughs> to really... Not, not that I... Um, uh, it it uh, knocked my personal confidence, but it made me question um, how we were going to do this if there was so much resistance in terms of saving the language, mm -hmm. revitalising a language that a big chunk of the population might not be into. But I think that's really drastically changed in 20 years and 
thank goodness, <laughs> because we've got we've got um, Pākehā, Hākotea, um, Nōhia, Nōkonei. So um, there's a real sense of this is our cultural uniqueness that we need to share and we all have a responsibility to make it um, truly thrive and represent us. Ko rero hia mai te tahaki tō whānau. I whānau mai koe i hea. Nā wai hoki koe i whakatipu. Well, um, e pākehā tōku māma, e Māori tōku pāpa, ahakoa, you know, it was his early 30s that he really realised. His, his parents were that generation of um, not able to speak Māori at school. And um, my grandmother was raised in Whakaki. And she's actually Pākehā, but she didn't know that until she was 15. Oh. So um, she grew up um, speaking Māori and um, with, with a Māori surname. And, um, and then I was told when, when she um, wanted to be in the Blossom Festival, mm. be a Blossom Queen, and um, her stepdad said um, no. And uh, she went to her mum and says, you know, the usual playoff thing of, of parents. <laughs> <laughs> she went to her mother and says, I really want to be a Blossom Queen, but dad won't let me. And um, her mum said, you can do what you like. He's not your real father anyway. Mm. And so she kicked him out, my grandmother, at mm. 15, and because he wasn't a very nice man. And um, uh, sh she um, was really staunch and, um, and went on to um, marry my father's real father. Oh, mm. It's so complicated. Anyway. <laughs> That's a good good <laughs> And um, he passed away when my dad was just one. So uh -huh. they moved from Frasertown near Wairua and um, moved down to Hastings. And my grandmother met Joe Mohi and, um, and they married and had five girls. Boom, 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 boom. So my father always says he was handpicked as, <laughs> as a kid, which is really code for he was the one and only son. <laughs> and, um, and so um, my grandparents didn't speak. Māori to the kids because they had been conditioned to think that that wasn't the way forward, the way to thrive and all those things in terms of a generational colonial impact mm. on our language and culture and, um, and didn't really even spend time much at the marae because um, the, the five girls under five um, was a pretty big gig mm. and... Um, and um, so, yeah, I, mm. my, my dad um, um, was um, second year fifth in the first 15, first 11, sports crazy. Oh, he's going to become a father. So. <laughs> <laughs> then my um, parents moved out to the farm in Central Hawke's Bay and, and then a couple of years later I was born. And, um, and you know, it was just um, pretty um, low-key New Zealand. But... Um, they named me Henewehi and um, in a sort of small town, small rural region, um, I was Hini and why you got a name like Hini? Mm. <laughs> and there were uh, lots of um, uh, interesting cultural things, not from um, any place of malice, but, but just um, ko wai koe, mm. <laughs> no hea koe because there was no understanding of, of anything Māori at all. And, um, and I sort of didn't tend to define myself as Māori, but I think what my grandfather said when I um, was upset about um, people ridiculing my name, um, he said, you know what Henewehi means, don't you? And I went, no. <laughs> I was seven or something. And... Um, he said, it means princess. <laughs> <laughs> and I truly believed he, <laughs> he meant princess for about another 10 years. <laughs> and then I went to St. Joe's and I got knocked off that couch. <laughs> and I was just another girl with another <laughs> Māori name that didn't mean princess. Yeah. So, um, uh, but I think it was his way of saying, you are a princess to us, uh, uh, and don't let anyone 
um, treat you otherwise, yeah. which was beautiful. You know, it's a grandparent kind of thing to do to to Afi and Totoko through some sort of lines of discrimination. But certainly, um, it impacted on them, which you know filters down through the generations. Mm. And and so for my father to decide to learn Maori when I was ten, and to really um, you know, pick that up and and take it forward. My grandparents were very much um, old school and simple living and never spoke Māori to us. But when my father um, um, revealed to them that he was learning Māori at their wedding anniversary, and um, I couldn't understand <laughs> why they were crying. But it was, it was because they'd been denied it for so long. And in a way, I think the Anthem experience was the same with, um, uh, for me, as their experience of going to school and wanting to speak Māori and not being allowed to, as my experience as singing a Māori and being told I shouldn't. Mm. and. Probably for the first time, I really understood what that meant because I I had had the experience of my father nurturing me, sending me to St. Joe's, sending me to Whariwananga or Waikato and really nurturing that side of me to being so important in my life. And, um, and the same as my grandmother growing up and only speaking Māori and then going to school and like, you will not speak Māori and if you do, you'll be punished. Mm. So... There's an interesting uh, process of, of how we, we've had, had it sort of beaten out of us or um, 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 it's been diminished, 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 but we've still been um, te ao Māori, tiwi Māori. We're like phoenix uh, rising out of the That's ashes right. and it's like we will not let anyone tell us who we are who we should be and how we should be. Mm. So that's what I, I gain strength from, knowing that oh we're all in this together and um, we're really strong and, yeah. and it's going to be an incredibly powerful um, future, especially with the, the, the kids coming through now. Did, did you know that you were part of your father's... It seems to me that you were a part of your father's cultural development plan, right? That this just wasn't about him, it was also about you as well, that you were going to be a part of this, and almost a sense of kind of inculcating you with the responsibility to carry this on. Did you recognise that at the time, know that at the time, or did it come out later on in life that you realised, oh, that's what he was doing? <laughs> yes, or maybe I was a test case dummy. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, when we were um, sort of forced to sit down with Te Rangatahi One, Tamahai and Riri, <laughs> yeah. Riri and Marama, and they were milking the cows and yeah. <laughs> going for a picky nicky, <laughs> I was thinking, all I want to do is go out there and ride my motorbike. <laughs> But um, there was something about his enthusiasm, his energy mm. and his passion that filtered through um, to a realisation that this was really important. The other thing about it was, um, which is kind of like a, another deviation from, from you know, your life's experiences mm. that you grow up with, um, we were doing correspondence and... Um, um, because you had to be over 16 to do correspondence school in the olden days, and I was only 10 or whatever, um, he actually put my auntie's name down instead. <laughs> and so my auntie Blossom and Uncle Charlie yes, Mohi, who yes. were doing correspondence school, kept on saying to my auntie Margaret, oh, you're doing so well, you're, <laughs> you're Māori. I'm just going. <laughs> but um, my father also, once a week, used to um, have a bottle of whiskey and we'd go into the Pukiora, um home for, I, I think they they didn't call them um, disabled in those no, days, no. handicapped or something terrible. There was the one at the home. south of Waipukuro. Yes. On the hill, yeah, we used I to know. go there as well with Teoti, yeah, yeah. So um, we used to go up there and um, Dad used to sit with Bab Pōmana, who oh, was yeah. um, quadriplegic, and, um, and just to hear the reo. 
So Dad used to also play records in the old days, big LPs of Māori music, mm. Inia Te Wiata and Isabel Cohen. And so that's where I think my singing and desire to... Ah. Oh, <laughs> because of um, that tuition and and just to hear the real because in the in those days as well it was a toll call for for us to ring my grandparents in Hastings from um, Central Hawks Bay and wow. just out of Waipukuro so um, dad didn't get much opportunity other than when he went to Porangao to to hear the language so Bob Pumana um, used to um, help dad and and we'd stay in the in the room for about five minutes and then go into um, with the young young people with disabilities that were... Because in those days, anyone with a disability would be um, expected to yeah. be... To go in a home. To yeah. go in a home. Yeah. And it um, must have been so hard for parents. So I, um, I was surrounded with people with disabilities at a time when you really didn't see anyone with a disability. Wow. And it was great for us, really good for us, particularly me. Yeah. So when Henera Gatoni was born, um, I felt like I had had a little bit of understanding yeah. from my childhood about what disability could possibly mean. Because that, that is a very different upbringing for most young Māori. Uh, at that time, spending so much time in places like Pukeora, I mean, the first I'd ever ever spent time with a community like that was at Te Aute, where we'd go out and sing poorly, as you know, uh, <laughs> with very few parts, um, out at Pukeora. And so for someone young, not at St. Joe's at that time, your age at that time, to spend time out there, it's almost like there's a bit of, um, what's it called, serendipity of longitude, because... You know, obviously with Hineto Katodi and what happens with Hineto Katodi in your time, it's like, a, oh, okay, these experiences have have helped in your life through time, right? It's almost like your father knew things were going to happen in your life and was preparing <laughs> you for them. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting you, you talk about Waipukuro because um, obviously I think a big impact on your life is your time at a Māori girls' school, um, which, which would have been tough. I think for your family, because it, it's a yes, it's a well-known school, but to send children to a school like St Joe's, you know, there's costs involved. There's a bit of distance, obviously, in getting there, and then of course you meet uh, a wonderful woman, <laughs> one of the greatest Tonga and Māori done, uh, although a very staunch woman uh, in Georgina Kingi. Can you tell me what you first felt, thought? when you went into the gates at St. Joe's <laughs> and were locked away from the rest of the world. <laughs> well, just backing up the bus just a okay. little titchy. Right. So I started at Hukarere. Ah, I didn't know that. not being Catholic, they only let a few non-Catholics yeah. in, as you know. And um, so... Um, we didn't have any Catholicism in our whakapapa <laughs> <laughs> that I knew of, just ratana and mihinare. Yeah. And, um, and so my sister had been expelled from there, so I wasn't looking forward to it. And um, at the time, Hukarere was on the hill, yeah. and um, we boarded basically at Hukarere and walked to Napier Girls High School. And it was a real difficult time for the school because all of the the boarding part and then going to Napier Girls and and um, and wasn't really enjoying it. And I entered a Manu Kōrero speech competition and and um, won the regionals. But in those days, the juniors didn't go on to the national competition. So mm. that was just left at that. But I remember it was at Te Aute and um, um, yeah, so I... I um, did well at that and um, then dad tried again to get me into St. Joe's and Miss Kingy remembered me as she does everything <laughs> 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 and um, and by then um, by about term, term two of my third form um, some girls had been so homesick that they'd left and there was a bed mm. and I was really lucky to get in. Why was your father so keen to send you there? Part of the plan. 
is part of his plan or yes so <laughs> he must be a bit of a visionary yeah. in all that mischiefness that is Mike Mohi um, because because um, um, he'd used music to um, oh my gosh I hadn't even really thought of this as my whole ideology about music and how that carries the language and everything as well but anyway he had used music to um, try and encourage a sort of a sense of of real Māori construction in a really isolated little microcosm of of um, our whare in um, in rural central Hawke's Bay so um, uh, he knew that the singing was incredible and really wanted me to um, harness that because I was already showing a love for music and wow. singing. And, um, you know, we were in a really small area, the, the pro local primary school, only about 60 kids. And, um, and so St. Joe's had an incredible reputation and I think Dame Georgina King he already at that time had a quite a reputation for her. <laughs> even though she wasn't principal because yeah. there were still nuns yeah. there yeah. and um, but she was the Māori teacher and and um, St. Joe's was already world renowned for her, mm. for its singing. So um, yeah, he, he um, took another crack at it and, and got me in and um, I never looked back. Wow. I just um, I loved everything about the singing and the and the um, sense of camaraderie, but the sense of place. Because for the first time, I wasn't Hini Maui <laughs> from Flemington. I was Hene Wehi Mohi. I was still Hene, but I, I was um, Hene. And it was like other young Maori women that, or girls that were, um, they were mostly really strong in their sense of who they were, where they were from, tribally, as well as um, Māori girls from New Zealand and Aotearoa. And um, yeah, it was a, it was a real um, game changer for me in terms of setting me on a path other than atui um, tamahai me riri, <laughs> me riri me marama, me piki niki. <laughs> Hatona o kupani, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was beyond the Tikaha <laughs> milking yeah. station. And the game with Takao. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was um it was beautiful and I loved everything about it. Wow. Miss Kingy Dame Georgina, <clears throat> the school no, it's Miss Kingy actually, <laughs> has a way of identifying certain individuals to undertake certain responsibilities. Were you, was it, was it very clear to you at the time that you had this gift through your voice and were you kind of propelled slash forced to <laughs> forward to, 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 to project that voice um, through St. Joe's? Was, was there an identification where you, you knew, yep, this is, this is my gig, I've been told to do this and I'm going to do it, and therefore that kind of strengthened, I guess, the natural talent that you had? Yes, well, I was asked to do a um, a solo for the group comps. Big deal, yeah. <laughs> especially as I was, I was pretty new, and um, Geraldine Richardson, <laughs> now Richie uh, uh, Jeffries, um, she asked me to do the the um, solo, and then. By the end of that year, um, Miss Kingley was handing out to some of the four formers um, the words to songs, and um, me and Barbie, Irana, yeah. um, were thinking, "Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is exciting." So there were all these like um, little signals that, um, yes, I, I want you to get prepared for this responsibility because it was a really big deal. It was as big a deal being in the concert party. They called it in those days. Being in the concert party of St. Joe's as being in the first 15 of Teoti College. Yeah. Yeah, That's sorry. real mana right there. <laughs> so um, I hadn't uh, grown up with swinging a poi, so I, I had to do some quick catch up. And um, my father, uh, along that music line, had um, bought me a guitar. And um, so he was really keen for me to, to learn to play and obviously 
sort of channeling me yeah. that, in that direction. But I just would hand the guitar over to someone who was really good at playing it and I'd sing along. And I had that training of listening to the New Zealand concert party that um, was on the LPs, mm. Isabel Cohen with her soprano voice. So I gravitated towards that um, vocal range and um, copied the the harmonies of, of that range. So um, I think Georgina saw me as um, quite, okay, I'm gonna put you there next yeah. to that senior so that you can hear that harmony and learn it. And, and so she was definitely isolating what, um, vocal harmonies and ranges that she wanted to get that beautiful, sweet um, effect of what is St. Joseph's Mighty Girls College. Right. And uh, we, and she's still very adamant, uh, Georgina today, Miss Kingy, that um, the singing is to be beautiful, feminine, delicate, and um, not angry <laughs> and hardcore because that is um, that is what she expects and that is what the school is well known for. And it's beautiful. I think even at one stage, it was almost like the clap was sort of toned down <laughs> just so that it wasn't so hard. And, yeah. and um, of course, kapahaka has evolved into this beast of a, of a thing that just really is embraced by rangatahi to to express who they are and um, it's in all its wonderfulness and all its different textures but certainly um, what is identified as the St. Joe sound mm. is the, the sweetness of voice and um, when I think of Maisie Rika I think of St. Joseph's and, and it's all encompassing when you're at the school and even has carried me through to my own recording of Waiata, the discipline and the focus uh, because in Kapahaka practice at St. Joe's it was militant really and uh, I know a lot of Kapahaka have militancy <laughs> as, a, as a code of conduct because you know when you're controlling a, a big group and you have all these different personalities you need to have the discipline and structure but um, it really set me in good stead for um, recording because I knew what it meant to do the job well and do it right and focus and not let any other distractions get in your way. Mm. One time I, I, we were rehearsing and <laughs> Miss Kingy said to, said to us, you just look like suet puddings. <laughs> Like what? <laughs> suet suet pudding. puddings. That was our reaction. What is a suet pudding? <laughs> and it wasn't like we could Google it or anything. So I think we might have gone to a dictionary and it was sort of just slop. Oh, I think. Okay. Okay. So um, we, we um, realised we needed to be far wow. more animated and beam and smile and project. And, and you know, in times when... Um, I have lacked in confidence or whatever in performing, and I think of her words, and I, I think of her um, courage and um, and absolute majesty. It gets me through, oh. and I can just smile through anything. Wow, but but how much of that is percentage inspiration from others versus or with percentage? internal gut uh, uh, knowledge, uh, internal confidence from yourself. Because it seems to me that, um, I mean, you, you knew, I think you, you knew you had a gift, you were good at this, and you probably realised that, which also gave you some confidence. And I guess I'm trying to figure out about, for those who would be watching and listening to this, about how much of it is, you know, self-confidence, assuredness, my own ability, because I know I can do this, added with other external inspiration and support and advice and counselling and all that kind of thing. How, how did that fit together? Or was it mainly just Miss King going, that's it, you're doing it in <laughs> no other way? Or Well, of, of, of course, um, like with any boarding school situation, you have camaraderie and, you, you know, it's not all smooth sailing. <laughs> and um, because imagine 200 girls, teenage girls, Caring for that, gosh, <laughs> it's, it's really a recipe for disaster. <laughs> and, um, and so that's why we needed the discipline and structure. And if you didn't like that, 
then he had to leave. Yeah. And I actually responded really well to it. So um, I enjoyed the um, knowing where I stood and knowing what was expected of me and, and then um, trying to um, actually aim for, for more. And I had been incredibly lucky to have a, a warm, supportive and um, um, loving environment that I grew up in and with family, with lots of diversity to, um, to, to take me to that place in my teens. And then um, Miss Kingy's instruction and support and even though sometimes it didn't feel like it. <laughs> but you knew where you stood. It wasn't yeah. like um, she was um, chopping and changing <laughs> what the parameters were. It was very, you were very certain. And yeah. I think for all of us old girls, we we realise that and now really appreciate that. Yeah. And retain that assuredness now. Yes. So how do you go then from an environment like that, almost military-like, <laughs> to uh, a community like Waikato University, it's filled with individuals like my mates, Te Kauhoi and Whare Hoka Wano, not necessarily of the same <laughs> kind of rigid militaristic um, kind of uh, upbringings of their high schools in Taranaki. Um, how do you survive at a place like Waikato? <laughs> well, it was um, because, um, because we didn't have a seventh form at St. Joe's at the time um, and... I would have had to travel to Central Hawke's Bay College. Dad said, oh, let's just skip it. And I went from the sixth form straight to university. So it was a oh. bit of a shock. So how old were you? 16, 17? I was 17. Wow. But I looked about 12. <laughs> <laughs> so I could never get in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a severe handicap at Waikato University is my understanding. Not that yes. I went there, but... Because uh... <laughs> the building was going wrong. <laughs> So I used to see the cops come in and go, funny fuck, <laughs> hide for a half hour, <laughs> then come out safe. <laughs> so even when I was legal age, I can't remember if it was 18 or 20. So, you know, most of most of my um, undergraduate years, I was doomed. <laughs> <coughs> and I, I do remember me and Peter Douglas getting kicked out of the Kiwi Tavern oh. because... And he, he was feeling so insulted because because <laughs> he felt he looked older and he was older than me. <laughs> and I said as we leaned against the wall, like, what do we do now? <laughs> At a loss. <laughs> oh, I didn't know about that. Pete, I'm going to hold on to that. Thank you very much. That'll be helpful for me. Um, now that he's in, a, in, in the office of the Prime Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But um, because... Obviously, at Waikato, Katutaki Koe King a Hautipua. Yes. O te reo. <laughs> and um, with, therefore, it was probably a seamless transition. Atu ya Miss Kingi kia. Kia timo tihira wa ko whare huia ko hini ni anu hoki. Ahena, kōrero mai, i pēhara wa o whakaaro i te wāi, i kite koe, i rongo koe, i kōrero koe ki enei Hautipua. Well, because, um, because I had to go that far to a university, so it was right out of Papakainga, it was right out of Hatuhohepa, and my mates had gone off to do a cement form in, in their homes, and so I was the only one there. No no friends? No friends. Really? <laughs> yeah. Hard to believe anyway, given who you are now. So I quickly socialised, <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, of course, Kapaka was yeah. right there, my first port of call. And, and the reason I went to Waikato was, um, rather than Palmy or Wellington, was because Lee Smith, um, oh, yeah. Whanaunga, and, um, and he was really supportive of when my dad was wanting to learn Māori. And, you know, he was one of the ones that took the petition. That's right. 72, 73, to Parliament to be signed. So he was um, a really strong supporter. My grandmother had taken him uh, to swimming training with my aunties, um, six o'clock in the morning. So um, he sort of felt like he really owned, owed the whanau some sort of um, payback. <laughs> but um, lovely. And um, he had said Waikato University is where all the 
the experts in Maori. And Ada Ngahau Te Boy. And I'd been instructed that I was going to do a BA in Maori. Wow. <laughs> By Lee. By Lee. Wow. And Dad. Wow. Yeah, that um, colluded. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I went there, not knowing anyone, anything other than Tamahai and Yui and Hata Mani. <laughs> And, and school C Māori and UE Māori. And um, um, I just loved it because um, I was also staying at the Teachers College Halls of Residence. So I was in two kapahaka at the time, wow. having the time of my life. And just absolutely taking for granted these wonderful um, people, these, these incredible... Um, Fountains of knowledge, all things Māori. So we, um, Te Rangihau was still there yeah. uh, in the research part of, of the university. And um, he, he was such an incredible man. And he, he would have turned 100 this year. So he, um, he was quite a bit older than Wharehuia and them. But Wharehuia quickly became um, the mischief guy and uh, always trying to um, tease or play practical jokes on us and um, and he was the sort of tikanga side of, of um, tuition and um, went into the sort of next level of, of um, class with um, Timoti and there were about three Hatopetra boys and me solo St. Joe's carrying the flag and um, and we had this Karaua Pākehā who was a professor in English and he was there um, as um, Timothy's absolute, because, you know, he was so eloquent in English and eloquent on paper. His pronunciation was ropey, but mm. <laughs> <laughs> he was um, a real great mind. Yeah. And um, Wharehui and Timothy, they, they really loved uh, working with him. So it was quite a small, diverse group of, of students and um and, and Hidani's um, classes were usually centred around something musical. Taonga Pūoro was sort of just the beginnings yeah. of. And of course his children were, were small, so he was writing them songs, little um, nursery rhymes, te reo Māori, because there was nothing like that around then. Mm. And, um, and occasionally he'd say, oh, you know, come in and um, I've got this concert to do, come and have a little sing song and and um, I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. And then he really nurtured my songwriting. So um, songwriting and, and love for music and taught me all about Henero Katauri as well as um, Timoti teaching me about haka and just love for Rewananga and also about Motiatia and mm. how beautiful and important the poetry of Motiatia is. Mm. I was lucky, really lucky. We didn't appreciate at all. You never do when you're young, <laughs> appreciate. You, you do now though, because you oh, talk God, about all yeah. these things. They've all yes. been a part of your life. And all been mentors, which is why, you know, that e hara taku toi, toa takitahi is absolutely true because whether or not they've passed on or whether or not um, you, you see them a lot or not, um, you always have that quarter way of, love and support around you to to know what's what's true and right and and um and gives you strength to go on immaculate conception <laughs> i've skipped some details obviously <laughs> It's a family audience. Uh, <laughs> um, Believe me, thank you. <laughs> um, when did you know that there were potential complications? So, on the birth. Right. I'm not able to talk about it for a few legal reasons, but um, it was immediately evident. So... That was all, you know, when you, when you have a baby for the first time, it's meant to be a wonderful celebration and exciting and exhilarating. But when your baby is born and you don't hear the baby cry, 
you know something's not right and um you expect that you have and um and I didn't get that and um without panicking teams come in baby's taken away and um (laughs) um bewildered and really still kind of bewildered 23 years later but um you learn to um embrace what has has been uh, presented to you and um do absolutely everything within your power to make the situation okay and um and there's a, a time in, in um, the life of a child with special needs where I think every parent tries to create normalcy out of extraordinary circumstances and, um, and challenges. And, you know, that, that's part of the process. And so when Henere Kateri was born, uh, she was in intensive care for a... Uh, about a month and um, I knew it was going to be difficult and challenging and and you're slowly um, given information when they start to do tests and and see what um, what the outcome might be so they're they're preparing you the physicians but you really um, you really don't have a full understanding and appreciation for it But if I think back to when my father first came to see us in hospital and, and, um, you know, having had the experience of knowing people with disabilities Mm. and um, Ted, who was, you know, Mm. pretty wobbly, Dad said to me, we don't care if she's wobbly. (laughs) And, um, And I don't care if she's wobbly. She's not actually that wobbly anyway, (laughs) but she is very much confined within her disability in a wheelchair, in her body that can't articulate, talk, walk, or really engage with the world. But she was born and because uh, because Hirini had told me about this beautiful essence, the goddess of music, Hine Rokitori. I really wanted to call my daughter Hine Rokitori. At the time, I didn't really appreciate that Rokitori, the goddess, um, was of the insect world and um, the moth species, the case moth, and that, um, as legend tells it, um, um, well, physically, the, the case moth is confined to her cocoon. The female of the species is confined to her cocoon, but the, the wind blowing through the cocoon creates this almost inaudible sound that, that the boy moths go, va, va, va. <laughs> and um, so that they are joined together. The female remains in the cocoon. When the babies are born and they they fly off, um, she remains in the cocoon and and that's um, how she rolls. Mm. And it's like Hinera Gatoi, she's confined to her chair, her world, but through her um, beautiful voice of of expression, her, her essence, she has reached out to hundreds of people through her disability and through music to um, help other people like her through music. And it's the most incredible thing that she can do that. And, and, you know, obviously we've supported um, her profile (laughs) as um, the um, ambassador, Mm. the patron of the Rokitori Music Therapy Centre, and um, we were given the opportunity to experience music therapy for her, and it was immediate that that her response to music was was something that was her jam, 
mm. and it was the way that she could express herself, connect with others and um, and really come alive and become so animated with the joy of music making within the limitations of her disability. So being able to share that with others, with other families and, um, and the, the initially with children and, and now the elderly and anyone with a disability or, or a special need, that they can actually use music to express themselves too. I've heard you talk about this a lot uh, because people have always said, oh, this is Henry Wahi's kaupapa. And I've heard you say, no, no, it's not, it's not my kaupapa. It's Henry Okotodi's kaupapa. It's an Okotodi music for, for a reason, which I think is a, is a wonderful thing. And I wonder what her aspirations are mm. now for this kaupapa. Where else does she want to take it? How much further can it go? Yes. Well, we, you know, in terms of um, a centre that we have in Auckland, um, we also have outreach programmes running in Whangare as well as Hawke's Bay. And, you know, we want to cover Motu Whanui. Mm. And there are other music therapy um, therapists working and operating in other parts of the country, but um, it's, it's wonderful to have a purpose-built facility that that really entity that that really is able to carry and support music therapy because it's a, a really special kind of um, therapeutic way to engage with with people with special needs and for them to be able to um, reflect a part of themselves to others with with conditions like autism where someone may be kind of locked in. Um, a, a situation where they're not able to reach out and, and we're not able to fully understand what that means and um, and I see it as a real whānau thing because mm. it impacts on, on the carers, on the, the families that are um, raising a child or a, a person with autism or any kind of condition where they're not able to communicate traditionally in a, 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 a normal way, a regular kind of way. Mm. They need um, assistance in, um, in being drawn out or um, being encouraged or motivated by music to, to interact and reach out. And I think the, the really important part is, for me anyway, is the unique approach around the copa behind the centre, number one, and the work that you have done and uh, Henry Okatari has done as well, but the unique kaupapa about it, because it, it is underpinned by who we are, what we do, our approach to the world, Henry Okatari and who she is, and, the, and, and, and again, that philosophical approach to Māori music, which is a powerful thing, and particularly for an Indigenous audience that will be watching us. They'll be thinking, wow, <laughs> you know, um, these are important aspects of who we are, what make us who we are, that can reach out beyond boundaries, beyond countries, beyond ethnicities because of our traditional Māori approach. I wonder if you're aware of how much of an impact that can have on people, no matter who they are or where they come from. The fact that it does have this Māori philosophical approach behind it, which makes it so open, accessible, approachable. Uh, I wonder if you realise about the impact of that. And whether or not you've heard that before or not. Well, certainly um, people over the years have, have um, said to me, oh, I just love your music. Um, that, one of the funniest um, examples of how it can reach out and be really far-reaching to the point where you just can't comprehend how it even got there. <laughs> but um, I was contacted um, by a taxi driver in New York <laughs> I don't know how he got my music. Yellow cab taxi driver in New York. Wow. Okay. Who played my music, Oceania, in his taxi. And he said that if he wanted to get in the taxi and go, wow, what is this? <laughs> and um, he had um, sort of studied it and found out that it was from here. Didn't understand anything, but uh, in those days with CDs, maybe even cassettes. Uh, he had seen all the words, and um, but it, it, he didn't even need to, yeah. to see the words to get a feeling 
from it and that's what music does it invokes feelings and it, and um and it's so uplifting and and heartwarming and heartbreaking and um emotion is just captured in music in a way that we cannot fathom and certainly I can't articulate in any language which makes me feel like um, I use music to carry te reo Māori mm. because I want te reo Māori to benefit and to reach people but because music therapy um, operates on the idea that it's music that um, draws out people and connects people no matter what language or what ability to speak or sing or vocalise. So it's actually the music that carries it, but it's about carrying human emotion and love and support and, and reaches in, reaches out. And it's the most magical way of, of connecting us all as a human race. Beautiful. There's so much more I want to talk with you about. I just just a couple of things, right? Um, what what do you say nowadays when people say, "Can you come and sing the national anthem for us at the All Blacks game?" <laughs> it's a funny old dude. You don't do the oh, uh, go ring Maisie. I've got her number here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> gorgeous girl. Um, I don't get rung up that much anymore. So uh, I don't know what it is, but um, certainly if I do get contacted about performing on any level, I usually defer to my tainer or my, um, <laughs> my um, uh, you know, the, the next generation of incredible voices because, you know, the ageing process is unkind <laughs> on a whole lot of levels. And I think that while musically um, I still love to sing and I love to perform, I don't get a lot of opportunity to sing and unless you keep your chops up. Um, it's like any kind of form of training before you go into being match fit. You need to have the space and the um, opportunity to rehearse practice and um, yeah, I, I don't have much time because of all the other things that I've filled my life with. Well, I was, I was going to say, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> uh, I, like the rest of the country slash the world, uh, was, was blown away by uh, Wires Anthems. Oh. Um, I think I may have mentioned to you privately that I now understand what they're actually saying <laughs> because all the songs have been translated by Timothy so and Tereo Māori. <laughs> I used to like the tunes, but now I actually understand what they're trying to say in the songs. Um, in fact, I think he might have given me more meaning to them actually than yes. what, maybe what was originally intended. But I do wonder how... <clears throat> You and I think it's because you're an extraordinary human being, which is part of it. Um, but how one manages, A, obviously trying to, to do what you do, be family, but also see at the end of it all, and this is just my perspective, at the end of it all, you've got a very clear outcome you're trying to achieve. Te reo Māori me on the whether, whether everything you do is, is uh, necessarily aimed that way or not, I wonder if at a conscious level you know, as long as I'm meeting that outcome, following that path, I'm, I'm all good. Is, is that what goes through your mind every day or is it something else? <laughs> is it um, faith of God and all that kind of stuff? Or? I think it, it's been the mentorship that I've had. I've been really lucky to have had and my exposure to extraordinary human beings that, and many of them have passed on, you know, Hirini and um, Wharehuia and um, Dalvanius and um, Ben Tawhiti, those kind of um, incredible mentors. And Georgina King, he really set me on, on a solid foundation and for, for a, a, a um, really clear sense of purpose. Even though I didn't analyse it or break it down or, or understand it fully at the time, it's always been um, my go-to place for for if I'm doubting any kind of decision for, for the direction I need to take. And um, I think um, music is the thread 
for my life story <laughs> and um, and it's always picked up and um, it's part of how I um, feel I can work best mm. by using music to um, heal, mm. by using music to find a pathway for te reo Māori, by using music to um, connect with others and to draw in um, support from others because that's what we need to do in order to revitalise the language, maintain the language and, um, and speak to everyone about um, the importance of the language as the cornerstone of the culture to um, embrace it, take responsibility for it. And it's, um, it's been the most wonderful experience doing Waiata Anthems. And I um, was um, I was quite um, structured in as far as realizing right from the get go that it all needed to be mint. Mm. And um, now living in Pucky Pucky Heights as we do, <laughs> Pucky Pucky AKA Havelock North, you know, five minutes down the road from Seymour T, I thought we've got to have you know the yeah. brand. Yeah. And um, yeah. I had the most pleasurable. Um, afternoon teas with Timoti translating and and moulding these um, kupu into an already existing hit mm -hmm. anthem of artists that are really popular around the country and um, really making it delicious and and it wasn't just a matter of literally translating and go away Get and make the it studio. fit yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and certainly making it fit to the rhythm of it's of um, a pre-existing song but Timothy's real um, understanding about composition that was so amazing mm. and I, I just felt really really privileged to have that experience with him and then the artists themselves um, you know, we had artists like Benny. She was um, she wasn't even born when I sang the national anthem. So uh, her understanding of that is sort of like that is whack. <laughs> what the hell was going on then? <laughs> and she had done third and fourth for Māori, so she she felt confident. Yeah. You know, millennials they're fearless. Yeah. And um, and then we had ones in their twenties, and they were all the same fearless, and they were kind of going sort of feels like you've done music and, and I go, I go, we, 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 and they go, oh, they did that in oh, you. German it's school. You. <laughs> we were fine. Yeah. <laughs> so they had a sense of, well, this is the way forward, hello. Yeah. And it started as a bilingual project that they said, I, I, I was hoping we could do the whole song in Māori. So it ended up being 100% wow. real Māori um, album, and um, and then the the ones in there, um, the the older artists um, who had been disenfranchised from from their culture and language, were just like, wow, this is such an incredible opportunity, and have used it as as the stepping stone for mm. their own real journey, which just blows my mind, and influence on their compositions and. I just I could never have fathomed what it would mean for them as much as what it was meaning for me because I was thinking on a selfish level here we are we're going to be able to use these popular songs I'll be riding on the coattails of their success <laughs> and translate them and um, they'll be amazing yeah. and they'll be singing them themselves and everyone will go oh man I love that song in English I love it even more in Māori yeah. and it would be a beautiful thing but it just has blown my mind how well received it's been from everybody, mm. as well as um, the artists themselves. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what. In conclusion, I'll say one thing: it takes the right person to get it there, though. And the what I think I mean by the serendipity of longitude thing is the right people come along at the right time, and really good outcomes appear. And I do believe. It's my own personal perspective, so it probably doesn't matter that much. <clears throat> but that wouldn't have happened without the right person at the right time. I, I think Hinato Katodi, the right person at the right time. I think your impact with the National Anthem, again, the right person at the right time, even though I might not have felt that way at that time. Um, so just for me, I want to thank you for the amazing impact that you've had in our society, in our country, 
um, in the Indigenous community. And um, <clears throat> I'm not as fearless as you, so I'm not going to sing to Whakarehu our quarter. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you for joining us. I really appreciated your time. I wish you all the best. Um, and kia tau ngā manaakitanga me te aroha o te hunga nā rātou koe i whakaungungu nga wharewia mā hini mā kia tau tonu ki rungi a koe hārea kene, hārea kene te nā hoa One thing I wanted to say Oh, here we go I was trying to, I was trying to conclude, but there we go <laughs> Well, it's just, you got me thinking and, um, and that's a good thing because um, sometimes when, you know Life gets in the way of um, taking time to reflect. But um, with um, a, a better understanding, I think, we have of mental illness and, mm. and adversity and tough times, and we all experience that at some point in our lives. And some people experience more, mm. and some people um, appear to be having a charmed existence, and some people really struggle all their lives and um, I guess um, those moments in time where I've thought um, this is the most devastating thing that could ever happen to me and um, and having the the love and support of each other to have been able to um, be able to get through and then find a platform or find a way to um, mm. regather the strength to be able to rise above it and use it as, as some way of learning. And I could not have done it without those mentors and those little Miss Kingies on my shoulder or um, the, the little um, mischief jokes of Farehuia or Tsenwati, um, e eh, hiniwiki e eh, with the eye roll. <laughs> I, I, um, I feel that that's all really important. Mm and um, as much as loving, nurture, afi, and being really open about our aroha for each other. And George. And George. And George. Dar darling George. <laughs> yes, darling Love George. Love you, George. <laughs> <laughs> On his way home from Portugal, been cycling. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.